Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. So I know you want to talk about the governor's latest political theater, but I've already put out a statement on that. And right now, we're going to talk about what we were scheduled to talk about today, a cold case from 1983. We owe that to the victims and their families. After I talk about that case, and after I take questions about that case, I'll briefly address the governor's presidential campaign. I'm joined today by Linda Sheffield. In 2018, my office created a conviction review unit to find and fix wrongful convictions. Two years ago, that unit exonerated Robert Dubois. He'd spent 37 years in prison for a rape and murder that he did not commit. Our investigation found DNA evidence that established Robert did not murder Barbara Grants. However, that DNA evidence did provide new leads and launched a fresh investigation. I'm here today to announce the results of that investigation. We have identified the two men who actually murdered Barbara Grams 39 years ago. They are still alive, and they will finally face a reckoning for what they've done. And in another breakthrough for justice, we've determined that the two men who raped and murdered Barbara Grams raped and murdered another woman in Tampa in 1983, a crime that has gone unsolved for nearly 40 years. The victim in that second case is Linda Lanson. Additionally, these men are subjects in other cold case investigations from the same time period in the Tampa Bay area. Let me talk for a minute about our conviction review unit. When we created our CRU, as it's called, it was the first in Tampa Bay and one of the first in Florida. And the CRU reviews plausible claims of innocence. It's there to safeguard against wrongful convictions. In nearly every case, the CRU confirms that the system got it right and the right person is locked up. But as we see today, in the rare case where an innocent person is convicted, it means the actual criminal got away with a crime. But for these victims, that stops now. It's extremely rare for exonerations to be followed by the prosecution of the actual perpetrators. But earlier today, a Hillsborough County grand jury returned two indictments charging two men in the rape and murder of Barbara Grams and Linda Lanson. We can now prosecute these men, and we will. Now, law enforcement detectives have been critical in the two-year effort to get us here today. The, these detectives carried these investigations forward from Tampa Police, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, in the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. And we shared one belief. This is why we put in all this work. This is why we're here today. To show Barbara and Linda are not forgotten. They deserve justice. Their family deserves justice, and our community deserves it. Let me explain how we got here. When we found and fixed the wrongful conviction, we didn't stop. We got to work. With our law enforcement partners working together, this is how we solve the cold cases. In short, the DNA sample in the Barbara Grams case did not contain any material from Robert Dubois, but it did include material from two other men. There's a national database containing DNA samples of certain convicted felons, and that database generated two leads, one on Amos Robinson and the second on Abram Scott. Both these men, Amos Robinson and Abram Scott, are currently serving life sentences in Florida prison for a murder they committed in Pinellas County in October of 1983. FD elite and TPD detectives started putting in the hours. They gathered more evidence. They built a case that we could bring to court to prosecute for the murder of Barbara Grams. And our conviction review unit supervisor, Teresa Hall, ended up reaching out to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office to ask them to open a cold case investigation into, Land into Linda Lanson. With leads on Robin and Sin and Scott, they were able to open that cold case. And as a result of those detectives' fantastic work, we can now finally deliver answers for Linda's family and peace for her soul. These two men, Amos Robinson and Abram Scott, murdered Linda Lanson. We now know that these two men carried out a sinister spree of rape and murder in Tampa Bay in the summer and fall of 1983. In July, 
Linda Lanson was found at the end of a memorial highway in town and country. She had been raped, shot in the head, and dumped in the bushes. In August, Barbara Grams was found behind a dental office in Tampa Heights. She had been beaten to death and raped. In September, Herminia Castro was found in a vacant lot in East Tampa. She had been shot and put in the trunk of a car, which was then set on fire. And in October of 1983, Carlos, Carlos Oriana was found in the woods in Oldsmore. He'd been kidnapped, beaten, and run over with his own car. Now, Robinson and Scott were arrested and prosecuted for the murder of Oriana, and that's the crime for which they're serving a life sentence now. In 1991, eight years after the offense, the state attorney's office charged uh, Amos Robinson and another man in the murder of Herminia Castro, but that case never made it to trial because of lack of evidence. Since then, Robinson's actually killed two more people while he was in prison, prison inmates. We've now connected Amos Robinson to four murders in a span of 103 days in Tampa in 1983 and Abram Scott to three murders. These men are serial murderers and rapists. And although they're already serving a life sentence, their crimes against Barbara Grams and Linda Lanson cannot and will not go unpunished. These two victims were wonderful and kind women and our community lost so much when they were taken from us. Linda Lanson was a freelance photographer. She was born in New York. She moved to Tampa as an adult. She left behind a seven-year-old daughter. Barbara Grams was a friendly, outgoing teenager who worked at the mall. Two amazing spirits taken from us in a terrible way. It's hard to put into words how meaningful it was for me to be able to share with Barbara's brother and with Linda's niece and daughter that after decades of false closure, or no closure at all, they finally had the answers that they deserved. Barbara's brother has elected not to talk with the media. We ask that you respect his privacy. Linda Sheffield, here, is Linda Lanson's niece. They were close friends and roommates, and Linda has lived with the pain of loss and uncertainty for the past 39 years. We're honored to have her here. These investigations have taken more than two years. It's been a massive undertaking. And again, I want to thank the law enforcement detectives who assisted and carried these investigations forward. They lend a voice to victims who can't tell their own story, and we wouldn't be here today without their work. I also want to acknowledge a few members of the state attorney's office. Assistant State Attorney Teresa Hall began pulling at the threads of the Grams case more than three years ago, unraveling a wrongful conviction. She quarterbacked the cold case investigations with the law enforcement agencies. In addition, investigator Ray Estevez and legal assistant Candy Perry have been instrumental in the state attorney's office work. But above all, I want to thank the victims' families. For 37 years, the Grams family had false closure based on a false story. For 39 years, Linda Lance's family has had no answers at all. Carrying this unimaginable grief They've been so patient and understanding as we work towards this day today. Before I finish, I want to make sure there's one thing everybody understands. The only person who benefits from a wrongful conviction is the actual criminal who got away with the crime. Let me be clear. Today's indictments would not have happened but for the work of our conviction review unit. A prosecutor's search for justice never ends. This painstaking work, our CRU retracing every step from an, a conviction 39 years ago, has not only freed an innocent man, but it's led to solving not one, but two murders from 39 years ago. This shows the power of a conviction review unit to right wrongs, to uncover truths, and to deliver justice to victims and their families, even after 40 years. With that, I'd like to allow Linda to share some of her thoughts. I am, um, excuse me, 
I'm Linda's namesake. She was my role model. She was a very strong, determined, warm, and wonderful woman that I personally depended on growing up. She taught me to count to 100. She taught me how to put on makeup. We go back. It was the beginning of my life. She was everything. These two men not only robbed me, but they robbed a seven-year-old little girl of her mother. I don't know if any of you have children, but she kept asking, is that my mother's car? Is that my mother's car? Where's my mom? Because she couldn't wrap her brain around what had actually happened. There are no words to describe what it is to go through 39 years of grief and not knowing what had happened, you know? I, I think at some point you stop and you um, forget about the criminals and you start to realize the void that's not there, you know, the void that is there for someone that helped you for so long. And today, I still have pictures of her all over my house. I have her paintings. She was an excellent artist, as well as a photographer. I have those still hanging in my home because she'll never, ever truly be gone. What Andrew has done here is so needed, not only for myself, but there are so many families this doesn't go away. When they're initially murdered, the shock is there. But 39 years later, the shock is no longer there. But the void stays, and the pain stays, and the crying stays. It doesn't go away. Our family is so grateful to Andrew, to Teresa Hall, who, with her dogged determination, not only went after um, these two men, but then went one step further to say, what else have they done? And that brought us answers that, honestly, we never thought we would get. We really never thought we would get. So we just grieved quietly. I hope, I don't know that I'll have closure because it's no longer about them. It, it, it's about, it's still about the loss, really. You know, I miss her very, very much every day. So with people like Andrew here that are really there for the people, for people that need him to do what he did, and did it so well. Uh, I, I keep saying thank you, and he keeps saying no, and I keep saying thank you, and he keeps saying no. But it's true. It's true. We need this, and we need it here, but we also need it all over the state. It's so important for him to spread the word and make it happen if he can. Can you do that? So my apologies for my tears. As I said, the pain, it, it never does. It never goes away. Never does. But hopefully we'll get some closure. Does questions? I don't know where to go from here. That's fine. So Linda Lanson's daughter was not interested in speaking with the press. And I ask that you respect her <coughs> privacy as well. She did prepare a statement that she asked me to read. I want to thank three people for their interest and their diligence in finding the murderers of my mother. First, attorney Teresa Hall, whose work for innocence and justice in these long forgotten cold cases is inspiring. Second, state attorney Andrew Warren, whose diligence and compassion have helped us through this horrendous experience. Third, special investigator Dan Bendig, whose tenacity and persistence 
will not be forgotten. For me, the loss of my beautiful mother will remain a walking nightmare. Excuse me. For me, the loss of my beautiful mother will remain a waking nightmare, but I thank them for at least bringing me some closure. Before we take questions, we had some information about the timeline and the defendants. Can I go with you? Yeah. Thank you. We have this slide that shows the two defendants, their criminal record. Oh. There's a picture of Linda and Barbara. Of it. I can also put it up again later. And then Andrew mentioned the timeline of all these different killings, and we've got that laid out here uh, that show July, August, September, October. And again, we'll leave it up for a few more seconds. Let's get some images. I can put this back up at the end, but I'm going to get uh, another shot of it. I'll cycle back through this really quickly in case we have gone. Picture of Linda. Happy to answer any questions about these cases. Can you talk about the advancements in DNA and technology that make this possible? Because otherwise, many of the work of the school would be here right now. The work of the CRU is to dig, to figure out what happens in a case, in, in those rare cases where we have a wrongful conviction, to fix it. In this case, because we were able to use DNA evidence that wasn't uh, available in 1983 at the time, we were able to definitively determine that Robert Dubois was not the murderer in this case. And it led us to these two other people. In terms of this, like the sample that you're using to process the DNA, was that something that was collected in 1983 and never able to be processed on that level, or how did that work? Where did that come from? The DNA sample in these cases came from rape kits that were collected and stored at the medical examiner's office they had never been evaluated. Again, back in 1983, the technology really didn't exist. DNA evidence was at its infancy. But today, in 2020, and over the past couple of years, we've had the ability to take those samples, run them through national and state databases to get leads, and then build investigations from there. So that, like, they were collected at the time because the technology was emerging, and so maybe they would be used in the future, or? They were collected at the time because it was standard practice at the time to collect them. Why they sat unearthed for nearly four decades until my conviction review unit thought to actually look and do something about it is a, a question for the cosmos, I guess. You know, it's interesting. Um, your perspective changes on murder. Um, but initially, like I said, when it happened, it was shock and um, disbelief, uh, whereas now it's more retrospective, um, so it does change. This is a day that I never, ever thought would come. So to be able to have somebody accountable for what they did, not only to my aunt, but to everyone else that they, and every other family that they touched, is beyond anything I, I would have expected. Um, it means everything to me. And as the days go by, it means more and more. Maybe I'm slow on the uptake, but this has been incredible. Um, and I know that Andrew will continue, I hope, to give this calm 
to other families because there are so many that need it. There's nothing worse than living with that for 40 years. There's, it's incomprehensible. So this is a beginning to closure, which I still don't feel. Linda, could you uh, spell your uh, last name for us? Sure. Uh, S-H-E-F-F-I-E-L-D. And how old are you? I'm 67. Do you live here in Tampa? Or? I don't live in Tampa. I live in Florida, but further south. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you say what city or what area or county? What county? Manatee. Okay. Any other questions on the cold cases? Okay. I do have a question yes. for Linda, but it is going to lead into what you were about to ask next. Um, I just want to know if um, you have any thoughts on the governor's announcement impacting uh, this film studio today. I, I would have to say no comment. Anything else anyone want to ask about? <laughs> sir, sir, can you describe the moment you found out? Where were you? How were you informed? What, from your perspective, went down from you know where you were and then where you were taken? Who gave you the news and what happened right after that? Were you surprised? I, I was shocked at the blatant violation of one of the most fundamental principles of our democracy that the people, the voters, get to elect elected officials. I've been elected twice to serve as state attorney, and I've served as state attorney, and I've done it well. Crime is down. We're protecting people's rights. We have fought so hard for public safety and fairness and justice. If the governor thinks he can do a better job, then he should run for state attorney, not president. Sir, can you describe where you were and what happened and how you got the news and you know what happened after that? I was doing the work that I was elected to do as state attorney. I was focused on delivering justice to Linda and her family that they've been waiting 39 years to get. I was making sure that everything went as it was supposed to today with charging these cases. And I was overseeing an office of 300 people that keep 1.5 million people safe in Hillsborough County. So while the governor wants to do his sideshow with his cronies, I'm the one who's upholding the law and keeping the community safe. Are you planning on challenging this suspension and where do you go from here? I, I haven't even looked at the order yet because I woke up to do my job today and that's exactly what I did. Now I've heard it contains a lot of conjecture and lies and just based on the governor's track record with unconstitutional orders, I have a feeling that this is going to be just as unconstitutional as the 15 week ban abortion, the anti-protest law and a dozen other things that the governor signed. The governor is trying to overthrow the results of a fair and free election. Two of them, actually. And people need to understand, this isn't the governor trying to suspend one elected official. This is the governor trying to overthrow democracy here in Hillsborough County. What's your response to the governor saying that you're putting yourself above the law, essentially, by signing those letters saying that you wouldn't prosecute abortion cases or enforce bans on uh, uh, free assignment surgeries for uh, so again, I didn't see the governor's press conference, the circus, whatever he put out there. What I know if you want to talk about the abortion ban, when I became state attorney, I put my hand on the Bible and I swore to uphold the US and the Florida Constitution. And under the Florida Constitution, the 15 week abortion ban is unconstitutional. And it's not just me saying that, it is a court of law that has said that. The governor's bill has already been thrown out. Now, it's subject to other appeal, but while the governor is hoping that the Supreme Court ignores the law in Florida, I'm the one upholding the law. I'm the one protecting people's rights. I'm the only one at this moment 
who's actually making sure that we are following the law in Hillsborough County. Are you worried that this project will be the last, the one we just saw you discuss here, are you worried this will be your last major project in State County? No. Do you have a response to Sheriff Thomaster and the other law enforcement officials who spoke out against you at the news conference this morning? I, I agree. Again, I didn't, I didn't see what they said. I didn't hear what they said. I do think the irony is a little rich. I heard Chief Dugan was there, excuse me. Former Chief Dugan was there. The man who opposed his own detectives looking into this cold case, the man who tried to obstruct this investigation to deliver the justice that these families deserve, he's talking about who's following the law. That's some rich irony. Have you had any abortion cases brought to you, gender reassignment, surgeries? anything like that, any cases involved with what the governor talked about? We've had none. None of those cases have been brought to us. We're not anticipating those cases being brought to us. You should go ask the sheriff whether he's had those cases and whether they're investigating, arresting people for that, because when they do and they bring us a case, we'll evaluate, it and we'll evaluate that case on the merits, like every other single case we do in the office. But at this point, again, from what I've heard, the governor's order is just based on pure conjecture and lies about what he thinks I'm going to do with cases that haven't even come before me yet. Do you think he's trying to make an example, kind of a, a chilling action here? I think the governor is trying to make a good impression on the Iowa caucus voters for 2024. Can you say more about Chief Dugan? Which, which I saw the Linda Lancer, or was a Hillsborough Sheriff's Office case? So the Barbara Graham's investigation Barbara was Tampa Police, Police okay. Department. Okay. No, I haven't yet. Are there plans to do that? You're obviously still here holding this press conference, people just questioning, you know, do you plan to step down or have someone take over for you? Uh, again, I haven't even looked at the order yet, so I don't even know where to start with all the nonsense that the governor's throwing out today. But you think you'll be, I mean, I, you, you said no to my question, so you think you'll be back doing this job as state attorney at some point? I'm still doing this job as state attorney. I'm the twice duly elected state attorney of Hillsborough County, and the governor signing something with a pen or a crayon doesn't change that. You're still doing the job as state attorney. What, what do you mean by that? Are you going to be, I mean, do you have power to still decide on prosecution? I, I'm still the duly elected state attorney of Hillsborough County. Next question. All right. Thank you very much, everyone.